Hey friends that are at home and those that are here this morning, I want to say thank you for being here. We have a privilege to go through God's word. Uh, can you mute the two reverbs? There's the top two buttons, there's the mute buttons on the soundboard. Yep. But let's pray and then we'll get started. Thank you, Father, for your word and thank you for being faithful to us. Thank you that we can study it today. Um, Lord, we ask that you would be glorified as we uh, read your word and as we look at the life of David. Lord, that it would impact us in Jesus' name. Amen. Two little mute buttons. There are six that are red. And you'll make the other two red. There's eight mute buttons right in the middle. There you go. All right. So we are in 1 Samuel 21. And with that being said, David, the life of David, we're coming to the conclusion of his life. Notice he has returned to the palace. And many of the enemies who are against David during Absalom's revolt are kind of coming out of the woodwork saying, oh, hey, David, uh, hey, buddy, old pal, how you doing? Hey, it's so good to have you back. And David's like, all right, all right. Hey, I know I'm king. Let's not kill Shimei. Let's not, let's not be vengeful, okay? I've got, I've got plans. Because David knew he wasn't going to be able to build the house of the Lord. Interestingly, we just studied that on Wednesday night, how Stephen told the Sanhedrin, hey, David wanted to build a house for the Lord, but... The Lord says, I dwell in the heavens in Isaiah 66. Who can build a house to contain God? God dwells in the heavens. Earth is his footstool. But nonetheless, David was preparing for his son or one of his sons to build a temple for the Lord. So David's like, hey, who cares? Let's, we'll deal with Shimei later. Let's, we'll deal with my enemies later. But then in verse 1 of chapter 21, there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Year after year, David inquired of the Lord. And so he's a praying man. And the Lord answered, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. Now, who are the Gibeonites? If you remember the book of Joshua, we studied when they came into the promised land, the Gibeonites are the ones who disguised themselves, act like they had been traveling for months because they had moldy bread and torn clothing. And they made a covenant with Joshua. Joshua did not seek the Lord, but rather they struck a, a promise, even though they weren't supposed to. And so then, from that point on, the Gibeonites were wood choppers and water bearers for the tabernacle and the service in Shiloh. So the Gibeonites were actually used for servants. And even though they were wicked, they were shrewd, and they said, we know that God is with you, so we want to make a, a covenant. And they did. So the Gibeonites, they come uh, to this junction in time, and there was a famine in the land of Israel because... The Gibeonites were being treated unfairly. They were, they were not being taken care of. They'd been killed by King Saul, many of them. So the king called the Gibeonites and he spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites, the children of Israel, had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. So Saul didn't study history. He didn't know that or he didn't care that there was a promise made to the Gibeonites. And so he was ruthless toward them. He killed them. Therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? He's like, God's been at us. He's been punishing us. So what can I do to make this right? So in short, the Gibeonites said to him, verse four, we're in 2 Samuel 21, verse four, we will have no silver or gold from you or from Saul, or from his house, nor shall you kill any men in Israel for us. So he said, whatever you say, I will do for you. He's like, we don't want money. We don't want you to kill any of the, any of the Israelites for us. He said, okay, what do you want then? And they answered the king, and they said, as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. He said, we're just really, we're tired of Saul's family trying to kill us, and we want you to give us seven of the sons of Saul. And so David said, okay, I guess so. But the king spared the one, remember, the lame son of Saul, Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, that sat at the table who was loyal and devoted to David. David spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath. Once again, David was keeping a promise. Saul did not keep a promise. The Gibeonites knew that they were promised protection, and so they wanted to right a wrong. And David protected Mephibosheth, 
because of his promise to Jonathan. So the king took Armani and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michal, the daughters of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the uh, Mahalathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first day, so in the summertime, in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, she took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. From the beginning of the harvest till the late rains poured on them from heaven, and she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day or beasts of field by night. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Beth Shean, or Beth Shean, where the Philistines had hung them up. After the Philistines had struck Saul and Gilboa, so he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his sons, from there. And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin, in Zela, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. Okay, long story short, Gibeonites were mad because Saul was trying to kill them, even though God was was going to keep his covenant that Joshua made. And so they said, give us seven of son, the sons of Saul. David did that, but he spared Mephibosheth. Jabesh Gilead had taken the bones of Saul and Jonathan. If you go to Israel today, one of the most awesome places is called Bet Shean. It's, it's just called Beth Shan here. But Bet Shean, it was destroyed in an earthquake in the first or second century, but you can still see the colonnade. You can see the amphitheater, kind of like a hippodrome kind of thing. You can see the highway, big bathroom, like these stalls, these, like a rectangular shaped room where people would use the restroom literally. There's homes, there's shops and businesses, and there's a huge hill overlooking and some really good falafel. Anyway, there's like a hamburger kind of, it's like a hush puppy inside of a gyro inside of, with french fries and lettuce and stuff. It's a really good sandwich. Anyway, you go there, and today that is the walls of the city where Saul and Jonathan were actually hung after they were killed in the battle. Remember they took the Ark of the Covenant against the Philistines in the battle and uh, they captured the Ark of the Covenant, right? And so we see not only that, uh, later when Jonathan and Saul died, they were hung and the Jabesh Gilead, these fierce men, they're like, we're gonna keep these bones. David went and retrieved them. David had dignity. Now we notice there's this concubine of Saul and she, what she do? This woman that was in the household of Saul, she protected the bodies from being pulled apart by buzzards or, or vultures or anything. She stayed up all night, all day, like basically with sackcloth, she preserved the remains of her household. And so David heard about this and he's like, okay, we need to give them an honorable burial because they were, Saul was anointed by the Lord. He was chosen to be king. And he wanted to make sure that those bones ended up in the house of Kish or in the tomb of Kish, which was the son, uh, Saul's father. So notice David's trying to do everything that's proper. He wants to get everything right with God before his sons take over, one of his sons. When the Philistines were at war against Israel, David and his servants went uh, with him, went down and fought against the Philistines and David grew faint. So he was tired. Then Ish, uh, Ishbi, Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. They're like, Hey, you're getting old, David. Don't go out to battle. Just, you know, just retire already, right? Now it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistine at Gob, the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, Sibachai, the Hushathite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. So notice there's still giants in the land at this time. Again, there was war with Gob, with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jerem Oregon, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was war at Gath, 
And there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, killed him. These, were, these four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So, relatives of Goliath. It's interesting. Before David was coming, he's coming to the end of his life. He's coming to the end of his fight, his battle. And yet God is giving him victory over giants still. He's doing what's right, and God is giving him victory over the things, those giants and enemies in his life. Should we be getting stronger in our walk with the Lord the older we are? Should we become more bold the longer we walk with the Lord? Absolutely. David is taking care of business, right? He is doing the next right thing in his walk with the Lord, and God is honoring him with favor. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day which the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and the hand of Saul. Okay, so there's a beautiful, we're just going to read through this psalm of David, this hymn of praise. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrow of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled and the foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went, out from his, went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by him. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. We are in 2 Samuel 22, verse 16. And just to stop here for a second, David is likening God, the unseen spirit who created all things, to be almost like a man who has nostrils. And to be like a, a man who comes down with feet and, and comes down on the wings of heaven and, and clothes himself in glory and splendor and darkness and, and power, right? So he's trying to put into words the deliverance he felt when God came through for him. And I think it's a healthy thing for us to do as we pick up in verse 17. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. For they were too strong for me. Who feels like they have enemies too strong for them? Has problems too strong for them? Problems too big for them? They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. Wait a second. David... David was a man of bloodshed, right? So what does he mean that the Lord has re rewarded me according to the cleanness of my hands? What David is saying is where I've sinned, where I've gone wrong, I've, I've asked the Lord to make my heart right again. And so David is saying I'm right through faith like Abraham. I believe in God. I believe he's forgiven me. I'm made right with him, so I have clean hands. You may have, I mean, we, I've met murderers. I've met rapists. I've met... People who've done things that they're like, how could God forgive? But if they've repented and they believed and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they are forgiven and they are made right. They have clean hands. And it's what they do from that point on that God will judge them, reward them according to their works. But it's nice. He's saying he's brought me out into a broad place. He's rewarded me because of the righteousness, my faith in him. Verse 22, for I have kept the ways of the Lord 
and have not wickedly departed from my God. Notice David equates righteousness with God for keeping loyalty to God. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. Interesting phrase there, my cleanness in his eyes. Your cleanness in the eyes of God is because when he looks at you, he sees the cleanness of Jesus Christ through faith. Okay? You believing in Christ. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. With the devious, you show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty or proud that you may bring them down. What truth is in verse 26 through 28? Jesus said, if you do not forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So you want God's mercy? Be merciful to others. Good morning. With the pure, you show yourself pure. Jesus said that the pure shall see God and the humble, blessed are the poor in spirit. They shall see, they shall be called children of God, peacemakers. Verse 29, for you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness for by it I can run against a troop, but my God, or by my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Sometimes when you encourage your kids, grandkids, nephews, whatever, the children that God's put in your care, you just see that pride beam and they're like, I can do anything because my parent, my grandparent, my uncle, my family member, my friend, my mentor believes in me. David was saying to God, first of all, God delivered me. Second of all, God has shown me kindness and mercy and he's pure and he's awesome. But also I feel like I can run against any army. I can climb any wall. There's no obstacle too big for me because the Lord is my help. And he's a shield to all who trust in him. That is true for us today. Are you trusting in the Lord? Do we waver? Yes. Do I struggle? Yes. But that's the trajectory of our life, trusting the Lord, and he'll be a shield to those who trust him. Verse 32, 2 Samuel 22, 32. For who is God except the Lord, David says, and who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power, and he is... He makes my way perfect or complete. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he sets me on high places. I don't know if you've seen deer run lately, but they are majestic. They are beautiful, and it's breathtaking. But he says he makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he sets me on high places. He, he, God has a way of exalting the humble. Notice how he's talked about humility before this. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. So war for war's sake, no. But as we read in Ephesians chapter six, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We are to realize we're in a spiritual battle. And David says, he's the one who strengthens me. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. I love that, right? David realized that the Lord had been gentle with him. And when you gently guide and rebuke those you love, coworkers, family, children, it's better, I tell my kids, it's better that we rebuke you than the judge or the jury, executioner, police officer. It's better that we rip into what we are concerned about here. Like, this is not okay to ever do that again, or this is why, because that way you don't end up running into the law. I mean, we don't want anyone to get hurt. What gets me more angry than anything is when my kids might hurt one another. It's I get scared that someone's going to get hurt. And then I, we try to correct. And it's in a gentle way. You know, in the heat of the moment, yes, there's a reaction. But it's a gentle way to say, this is not okay. And David recognized in gentleness, the Lord has made me great. When the Lord in his still small voice says, Michael, you need to change this. Justin. <laughs> You need to change the way you're, you're saying that, what you're doing there. And we listen, then that's the, the way of the Lord to, to show you, okay, you've been faithful there. Let's move on to the next thing. You know, It's not 
the voice of the devil that's harsh that says, you're a failure, you're a failure. I can't believe you would do that. No one will love you anymore. That's the lie of the enemy. That's harsh. God, in his wisdom and in his truth and in his spirit, is gentle. It's in your gentleness. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. Anybody ever slipped and hit their tailbone really hard? Ouch. I did that once on a snow, snow sled. But God wants us not to slip. Lead us not to temptation, right? Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. So God gave David complete victory. And I've destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. So you have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth and trod them like dirt in the streets, and I spread them out. Okay. David was a man of bloodshed. Jesus did not teach us to be men of bloodshed. I mean, he did say um, something about carrying a sword and whatnot, but he didn't say go out and hurt people. He said go and make disciples. David here is recognizing that when he had people who wanted to kill him, that God gave him utter and complete victory. So that where he had no more worries, like God put them down. When Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave, that was it. He said, it's finished. And so I think there's that attitude of complete victory and completeness, perfection, and no more worries. And sometimes we forget that we are fighting defeated foes when we get demonically, uh, spiritual warfare, right? Anybody been attacked and, t and, and trials? And sometimes it's physical, psychological, social, mental, emotional, financial. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And yet, we're victorious because God is on the throne. Jesus rose from the grave and we believe in him and he lives in us. And so, as hard as it is in our flesh to operate like that, David's trying to basically say they were like dust. My, you make my enemies like dust spread out. And it's not the violence that's the key. It's the fact that God gave the victory, which is the key. Is God giving us a victory? Do we claim that victory? You also have delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me from the head of the nation, or as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. Now, this could be deemed as messianic, meaning Jesus, because look at Jesus. There's still nations all over the world, whatever they call him, Jesus, Isa, I mean, whatever culture, whatever they call him, Jesus is, like Psalm 2 says, ask him, I'll give you the nations, or the heathen, or I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. Psalm 22, when Jesus, his crucifixion was prophesied by David, it says later that he'll have brethren, he has brothers and sisters from all over the world, every tribe and every nation. And David is saying, there's people I don't even know who are submitting to me. And so too, Jesus calls to the ends of the earth, foreigners, Submit to Jesus. People who weren't even really looking. I wasn't really looking for the Lord. I believe the Lord called me. I believe the Lord spoke his truth. I heard the gospel. I responded. I mean, you look at that. God, I love this. Uh, foreigners fade away and they come frightened from their hideouts. When Jesus comes back again and he raptures his church and then when he comes and rules and reigns, it says that the rulers of the world in the last days will be hiding the rocks and saying, fall on us. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. The God, let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up against those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. He is a tower of salvation to his king. And shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. So David is caught up in this praise, as we'll continue it, his last words here. But he's caught up in a praise saying, God, you're awesome. You've delivered. You're the rock. You're the, there's no God like you. And my enemies, they were all dismayed because they tried, but 
you had your way. Even though people wanted to destroy me, you had your way. So God did his miraculous work and he's saying, I trust in you. You've shown mercy, not just to me, but to my descendants. And I think, just put David aside, like, like remember who David is, but look at my life, look at your life. God delivered us on the cross, but he delivers us every day that we choose to trust him, even in our trials, even when it doesn't make sense. God says, I am still savior, I'm still Lord, I'm still deliverer, I'm still creator, I'm still God. God is still God. And it's nice to just be caught up in that moment and to declare to the Lord, like I have throughout the week, I'm sure you have been thinking about the Lord at points throughout the week, but when you just recognize what he's done, just say, Lord, you've done this. Lord, you are this. I don't, I'm struggling, Lord, but you are in control. I acknowledge you. And you're putting to death the flesh when you do that. You're saying, I know my body and my mind are telling me this, but God, I know you are. I know you are. I know who you are. I trust you, Lord. So David was doing this. And then we get to his last words, chapter 23 of 2 Samuel. Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. So he's saying, yeah, I could write some songs. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. So he acknowledged God's spoken through my mouth. I, can, I, I know that... Like Brenda Lane says, sometimes I'll be talking with someone. She's been the women's minister here for years, you know. Uh, but she's like, she would listen back to a message she taught later. And she's like, well, that was good. That didn't come from me. That was the Lord, right? And sometimes that's, God will use you in your conversations. But David recognized, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me. And his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. So if anyone wants to be a good leader, you better respect God or else God will depose you very quickly. He can pull us down quickly, right? He has all the permission in the world to do that. Sometimes he allows corruption, but eventually they will have to answer. He will have his way. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. We must fear the Lord as we rule or lead or help others. And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after the rain. Have you ever had a, I mean, it's a beautiful day today, isn't it? You, you get out and you're driving down the road or you're walking down the street and you can see the dew on the grass and you can, there's not a cloud in the sky. You can hear the birds chirping. You can just see the unadulterated, unperverted, beautiful, pure splendor of God. And that's what he's saying. That's what it's going to be like. If someone rules well, it's going to be like a beautiful day, a grassy knoll, so to speak, or a grassy hill, a grassy hillside. And shining after the rain. Do you... You know, we spend so much money on, on gold and silver and jewels, right? Which are just going to be like the foundations of heaven. Like it's just going to be like dirt and rocks are going to be. Gold is literally going to be the, the, we talk about the asphalt of heaven. That's what gold is. Well, the beauty that God can do with just a little bit of rain, <laughs> the rain, the, the, Corny dad joke, but uh, I, I read one last night. But did you hear that there was a ray of light that got arrested, Steve? Yeah, it got sent to prison. It was a light. It was a light uh, sentence. But the idea is God divides light. We don't even understand light. It's a wave, but it's also a particle, but it's also energy, right? It's these three different things, and scientists are like, "Wow, light is crazy to understand," and yet. The Bible in 1 John 1 says God is light and in him there's no shadiness or darkness at all. So God is light. He's energy. He's luminousness and he's fire. Like heat, and power, luminousness. He sheds light. He's uh, able to illuminate and bring things to light. But he's also 
the light by which we can see what's right, what's wrong, what's not right, how to get right, how to stay right, those kind of things. But when we look at this, when it rains and you have a little bit of light traveling through water, we get to see such great phenomena. And it even looks like just the, if you look microscopically at water, if you look at the dew, on, we used, I used to caddy all the time at golf courses, and you would not see footprints until you were the first one on the course sometimes. But you could just, the beauty of water beating up on top of grass, like little perfect circles, right? Perfect beauty. And that's what he's saying. Good rulers who fear God, that's what it's going to be like, guys. So I want our lives to be beautiful, but I know we have persecution. I know we have trials. But David was just acknowledging. If you fear the Lord, you're going to have more beauty. Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? But the sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. So if you're a rebellious son, you're like a thorn. It's no good. Throw it out. But he's kind of saying, you know, God's given me a covenant. He's ordered all things and they're all ready to go. And this is what I want. You know, he promised it to me. So he's kind of coming to the end of his life. He's saying, oh, I hope I have some sons that aren't rebellious. But the, the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. He's basically saying, I don't want rebellious sons to rule after me. And that would become, once again, another issue that we'll see unfold here in the next couple chapters. And then we see the rest of this chapter it describes some of the mighty men of David. These are some of the names of the mighty men of David. Hab, Josheb, Beshebeth, the Tachamanite, uh, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. That's crazy. And after that was Eleazar, son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of three mighty men of David. When they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated, he arose and he attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand was stuck to the sword. And the Lord brought about a mighty victory that day. And the people returned to him, um, returned after him only to plunder. So he took care of all the battle and then people just took the spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agai, the Herotite, or Herorite. The Philistines had gathered together in a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils or beans. So the people filled, uh, fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field and he defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Then three of the 30 chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam and the troop of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in the stronghold and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. So David said, with longing. Okay, so David's in Jerusalem, city of David, stronghold, palace, fortress. And he's longingly saying, you know, even though the Philistines have taken over Bethlehem, which is five miles away. He says, oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. You know, he was a shepherd in Bethlehem. And so he knew where there was some really good water in Bethlehem, which is now Palestinian territory, by the way. Uh, we had a Marine who was traveling to Israel with us who from 29 Palms maybe, or from California, they would not let our whole group go to Bethlehem because you can't have an active duty Marine go to a Palestinian area. It's interesting. David said with long, oh, that I could have some water from Bethlehem. So three mighty men, they broke through the camp of the Philistines. They drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and they took it, and they brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but he poured it out before the Lord. To, so these three guys, they go out of their way, five miles away. They risk their lives. They give him some water, and David's just like, whoosh, pours it out on the ground. What in the world, right? And he said, he made it like a drink offering with the Lord. The Lord, he said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. He just basically said, you risk your lives. I can't just drink this like it's uh, Aquafina. It's not a big deal. No, you guys, I'm going to pour it out. You guys risk this because you identified so much with me as your king, as your friend. 
Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of another three. He lifted up his spear against 300 men, killed them, and won a name among the three. Was he not the most honored of the three? Therefore, he became the captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of valiant men from Kabzeel, who had done many deeds, he had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. Pastor Bruce really likes that story. This is a book that he read about it. But he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. An Egyptian had a spear in his hand. So he went down to him with a staff. He wrestled the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and he killed him with his own spear. These things Benaiah the son of Jehoiada did and won a name among the three mighty men. He was more honored than the thirty, and he did not attain to the first three, and David appointed him over his guard. Asahel, the brother of Joab, one of the thirty, Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shema, the Herodite, Elika, the Herodite, Helez, the Palthite, Ira, the son of Ikesh, uh, Ikesh, the Tekoite, Ebezar, the Anathite, uh, Mebedai, the Hushathite, Salmon, it goes on and on and on, their names, but uh, Helab, Ittai, Rivai, Gibai, uh, Gibeah, the children of Benjamin. Benaiah, on, 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 on. Let's see. So he just names these. So 37 in all of these men. Uriah, the Hittite, was named as well. Bathsheba's husband. Okay? So David had 37 men. Think about it. All these different men who God surrounded him with. And yet David attributed all of his battles and victories to the Lord. Okay? Love your friends. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. But know it's the Lord who wins your battles. And know that your friends are not the enemy. Don't be treacherous toward our brothers and sisters. Like he was with Uriah the Hittite. So we look at the life of David. He was surrounded by men. But yet his eyes were on the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in the face of our battles, you are the rock you are our salvation. Lord, you come down from heaven and rescue us in our times of calamity. You come to us in our time of need with compassion, and your gentleness makes us great. Lord, we thank you that as we study your word, as we look at the life of David, as we look at the honor of various people who they were just doing what you had called them to do, I ask that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who rejecting and, and despising the shame, he bore the cross and he suffered humiliation and crucifixion for us so that at every, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father because of his humility. Lord, I pray that we would be humble to recognize every good and perfect gift comes from you. Jesus, that we would recognize that if it weren't for you, we would be nothing, we can do nothing. But in you, we can go against the troop. We can climb any wall and we can have victory. So Lord, we thank you for the victory you give us. Jesus, we ask for more victories. We pray for boldness that we would speak forth your word. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives. And for those who don't trust you today, that today would be the day of their salvation. That they would say, I trust you, Jesus. King Jesus, that you are my savior. You are my Lord. You died on the cross. You rose from the grave. You're coming again. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, we ask that. For those who hear your message today all around the world and here, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.